I've spent the better part of a decade crisscrossing two countries, the United States and China, trying to make sense of the new global friction. And what I've learned, what I try to capture in my book, Breakneck, is that the competition between these two superpowers is best understood not through vague political labels like capitalist versus socialist or democracy versus autocracy, but through a simple uh, uh, visceral question, which country can still build things? And the answer, frankly, is a punchline because the core conflict today is between China, an engineering state that excels at construction and speed, and the United States, a lawyerly society bogged down by procedure and masters of obstruction. I can prove this with a single excruciating example, the story of two identical high-speed rail projects. In 2008, voters in California approved a state proposition to fund a high-speed rail line linking San Francisco and Los Angeles. That very same year, China began construction on its own line, the Beijing-Shanghai high-speed rail. Both projects were planned to be around 800 miles long. Now, um, fast forward three years to 2011, uh, the Beijing-Shanghai line opens for service at a cost of $36 billion. In its first decade, uh, it carries 1.35 billion passenger trips. Uh, it became a vital uh, functional piece of uh, China's transformation. And California? 17 years after the vote, California has built a small stretch of rail connecting two cities in the Central Valley, neither of which are close to San Francisco or Los Angeles. The latest cost estimate for this struggling project, $128 billion. This staggering price tag, over three times China's cost for the entire project, isn't an accident. It's the signature of the lawyerly society. Why so expensive? Why so slow? Uh, in part because some local politicians successfully lobbied to have the train at a stop in their district, forcing the line to take a more torturous route through an extra mountain range. It's also because the California Rail Authority openly prefers to advertise the number of high-paying jobs it's creating rather than the actual amount of track it has been laying. The delay is so profound that the margin of error for estimating when a partial leg of the California line will open sometime between 2030 and 2033 is the same amount of time it took China to build the entire Beijing-Shanghai system from scratch. This, my friends, is more than a simple infrastructure problem. This is a geopolitical metaphor. The American ethos, once one of ambitious construction, has been replaced by procedural paralysis. You don't just notice the difference going from the lawyerly society to the engineering state. You saunter, tread, and amble upon its works. In the US, our infrastructure is falling into a pitiable state. In China, they are building new systems of subways, bridges, and highways at breakneck speed. The US has lost its sense of urgency, its muscle memory for building. This is the tragedy of the lawyerly society an elite so focused on process, they've lost the capacity for action. And uh, it's a profound self-inflicted wound. We Americans live today in the ruins of an industrial civilization where our infrastructure is just barely maintained and rarely expanded. The story of the $128 billion train isn't a fluke. It's the inevitable outcome of a system ruled by lawyers who excel at litigation, regulation, and ultimately obstruction. Let's look deeper into how this came to be. Um, the problem of America's inability to build um, stems directly from the composition and motivation of its ruling class. In the United States, we are governed by lawyers. Five out of the last 10 presidents attended law school. At least half of the US Congress holds law degrees, while only a handful have studied science or engineering. The only two US Presidents who were engineers, Herbert Hoover and Jimmy Carter, are remembered for their dismal political instincts that produced thumping electoral defeats. The ascendancy of the legal elite was initially rooted in a necessary corrective. In the 1,960 seconds, America was a frightening place. Factories leaked chemicals, oil platforms spoiled the seas, and urban planners rammed highways through neighborhoods. 
the public grew alarmed by the unpleasant byproducts of unchecked growth, environmental destruction, and corporate interests overriding the public good. Students at elite law schools adopted the rallying cry, sue the bastards. The mission of this rising legal class became simple, stop as many things as possible. This philosophy developed into what law professor Nicholas Bagley termed the procedure fetish. The system elevates process over outcomes. Designing new rules and committees becomes a substitute for thinking hard about strategy and ends. An agency must conduct every conceivable study, ventilate every option, engage every identifiable stakeholder, and weather the most stringent judicial review before any action, however minor, can take effect. The political environment insists that a more rigorous process is the solution to every quandary. This simply leads to endless bureaucratic deliberation and paralyzing judicial review. Lawyers have vastly more tools to stop something than to create something. Every agency must check so many boxes because they know a single lawsuit could be used by an opponent, say, a wealthy homeowner worried about noise or property values to convince a judge the agency didn't study the environmental problems hard enough. The outcome? After exhaustive research, little ends up built and Americans are left with decaying infrastructure. This procedural neurosis is further complicated by a deep systematic bias toward the well-off. Lawyers are too often the servants of the rich. They help um, wealthy homeowners litigate construction projects out of existence. This elite class of the bar and the bench constitute the American aristocracy. They are why we, as a nation, have astonishingly successful corporate value creation alongside deeply dysfunctional local government. The lawyerly society shines in protecting wealth, but it leaves the poor and the working class behind. They are the ones who suffer from dilapidated public transit and the crippling lack of new construction and affordable housing. The problem for the United States today is that the solution to its mid-century problems, litigation and regulation, has become the cause of its current problems, stagnation and inefficiency. Our commitment to pluralism and protecting the individual is a profound virtue, but when combined with proceduralism, it has made Americans lose faith that their government can meaningfully improve their lives. To regain that faith, the United States must overcome the lawyerly society's obsession with obstruction. It must recover some of its own engineering prowess. Across the Pacific, the system is designed precisely to maximize construction and disregard obstruction. China is an engineering state because engineers have quite literally ruled modern China. As a corrective to the chaos of the Mao years, Deng Xiaoping promoted engineers to the top ranks of the government. By 2002, all nine members of the Politburo Standing Committee had trained as engineers. They were hydraulic engineers, thermal engineers, and veterans of heavy industry conglomerates. For his third term, starting in 2022, Xi Jinping, who studied chemical engineering himself, stacked the Politburo with executives from the aerospace and weapons ministries. These are people with um, practical experience managing mega projects. What do engineers like to do? Build. This is their political mandate. Since 1980, China has built monuments on a scale that defies American imagination. An expanse of highways equal to twice the length of the U.S. system. A high-speed rail network, 20 times more extensive than Japan's. As much solar and wind capacity as the rest of the world put together, it has built so much housing that, in effect, the state built a new city the size of Greater New York City and Greater Boston combined every year for 35 years. This building frenzy is why portfolios of high net worth investors were once asking me, can China's political system really breed tech giants? The answer isn't just yes, but that the very system that enables this unchecked construction is the foundation for China's power. Take the remote, impoverished Guizhou province. It is China's fourth poorest province. But because the engineering state sees infrastructure as the solution to every quandary, it has poured massive resources into it. Guizhou boasts 5,000 miles of expressways and over 1,000 miles of high-speed rail. It has built 45 of the world's 100 highest bridges. This infrastructure creates tangible convenience and connection for rural people, helping them believe that progress is actively coursing through the country. For the people in Guizhou, this investment has created an enthusiasm and an expectation for physical change rarely found among Americans today. However, this unchecked mandate has two enormous consequences. 
First, the recklessness of ambition. The system rewards construction, leading local officials to invest in vanity projects merely to advance their careers. In Liu Panshui, former party secretary Li Zaiyong authorized 23 tourism projects, including elegant temples and poorly painted replicas of European town squares, and tried to create a ski town in an area that rarely sees snow. His schemes failed, leaving the city with $21 billion of new debt and his career in ruins. His confession captured the core logic. When asked about the spending, he replied, it was the nation's money, not mine. Second, the brutality of efficiency. The central tenet of the engineering state is to look at people as aggregates, not individuals, right? Its philosophy is to maximize the discretion of the state and minimize the rights of individuals. This is where the sheer force of the engineering mindset turns malevolent. Treating social issues as math exercises where all human activity can be directed, restricted, or blocked with the same ease as turning a series of valves. This mindset gave us the one-child policy, a brutal exercise in population engineering designed by cybernetic scientists. And decades later, it gave us the catastrophe of zero COVID. The contrast between the two countries comes into sharpest relief when we examine the human cost of the engineering state's obsession with a number. When the Omicron variant hit in 2022, the engineering state pursued its zero COVID strategy. Just as with the one-child policy, the target was clear. The number was in the name. Shanghai, the Paris of the East, was slammed with the most ambitious quarantine any state has ever attempted, two months of near total confinement for 25 million people. The lockdown succeeded only in producing utter misery. Logistical collapse. The surprise lockdown led to a breakdown in the food supply chain, forcing residents from celebrities to venture capitalists to spend hours fighting for grocery deliveries. Medical absurdity. Uh, the state only noticed COVID, ignoring life-threatening conditions like cancer and diabetes. Hospitals refused entry without negative tests. Critically, for three years, the government made it difficult to buy basic fever reducers like ibuprofen for fear people would disguise their illness, leaving the population defenseless when the virus finally broke containment. The price of control, the state even temporarily separated babies from their parents if both tested positive a move that only reversed after a massive public outcry. And the engineering state's digital surveillance apparatus enabled total control using QR codes to regulate entry to public spaces. The engineering state can be too efficient and make snap decisions with so little regard for people. This pursuit of a singular engineering goal drove the country mad. The consequence of this repeated trauma is visible in the Rune movement, the desire to flee. Wealthy Chinese are emigrating and buying property abroad. The creative class, journalists, artists, software developers are moving to places like Chiang Mai, Thailand, because the ceiling keeps getting lower in China. They feel smothered by controls and censorship and are tired of the constant threat of catastrophe. The irony is profound. The engineering state delivered a sustained rise in living standards, but is now chasing away the very people, the wealth, and the creativity it needs for its ultimate quest for power. So who wins this contest? The contest will not be won by the country that has the biggest factory. It will be won by the country that works best for the people living in it. The United States still holds profound and enduring advantages over China. Our commitment to pluralism is the most important American virtue. We are better equipped to figure out the right solutions because we allow for debate, criticism, and diverse voices, lawyers, economists, engineers, and humanists to be in the mix. This is the virtue of the lawyerly society. It prevents catastrophic state-led error. But this is not a comfort that lasts. Our lawyerly society is so focused on avoiding the mistakes of the past, the mid-century arrogance of builders like Robert Moses, that it has lost its capacity for action. We can't respond to climate change without large-scale construction, yet the pursuit of the U.S first offshore wind project was derailed by wealthy, liberal residents and 16 years of lawsuits. We can't solve economic inequality when prosperous cities use legal obstruction to block housing, making every rise in housing prices a policy failure. Uh, and we risk losing a geopolitical conflict if our defense industrial base cannot manufacture munitions quickly enough, relying instead on high-tech algorithms that won't win a battle without drones and shells. 
The United States needs to relearn two things to overcome the lawyerly society. Reclaim its engineering heritage. We must remember that we built the longest suspension bridges, the first skyscrapers, and the Apollo program. We need to recover the virtues of speed and ambitious construction. Elevate diverse voices. Lawyers must be joined by engineers and non-lawyers to make sure the country is able to work for the many, not just the few. China is still building, still moving, with that reckless speed, determined to be a great manufacturing power. They will dominate the tech supply chains of the 21st century. The United States must build to stave off being overrun commercially or militarily by China. The path forward is not to adopt China's brutality, but to recover our own sense of dynamism to prove that democracy can deliver essential goods and large-scale projects without descending into authoritarian paralysis. We must recognize that the failure of the $128 billion train isn't a statistic. It's a strategic weakness. The stakes are too high for us to remain the lawyerly society that excels only at obstruction. We have to build, we have to transform, we must recover that sense of optimism, 